they were testing me for things like um, cancer, um, diseases, any different diseases. It's excruciating. It's the kind of pain that takes you straight into hospital. To breathe was hard. You know, I just wanted it to end. It was so, so painful. It's been reported as things like 22 years until people have been diagnosed. I had MRIs, CAT scans, everything was clear. It's nice to be told, you know, it's not just me that's out there. It hasn't been the easiest of times because, I mean, you never want your kid ill. I do my own research, I do my own checking on my own safe lift and online to make sure because it is my life, it's not theirs. Alicia is 23 years old and lives in Medway in Kent. She suffers from a rare blood disease called porphyria. It means that certain things like stress or medications can trigger attacks to the nervous system. During an attack, she experiences excruciating abdominal pain, confusion, nausea and dizziness. Most porphyria patients will only have one or two attacks in their lifetime, but Alicia has had 17 in the past four years. When she had her first attack, her doctors couldn't figure out what was wrong. I have acute intermittent porphyria, which is just basically like a very rare blood disease. I was first diagnosed in March 2014. I was at work, I ended up collapsing at work and then getting rushed into A&E. They, they'd done so many tests they couldn't, couldn't find out what. It just came out through family members that my nan had it. So would it be worth testing for it? And they test for it and two days later. I was pretty much, once they gave me the treatment, I was pretty much talking again and out of intensive care. Porphyria is a rare genetic condition which affects the levels of heme in the blood. Heme is a compound most commonly found in hemoglobin in red blood cells, and it helps carry oxygen to different parts of the body. It's made up of iron and porphyrins, a kind of pigment molecule. When someone doesn't have enough of it, it causes a buildup of iron and porphyrins in the body. This can lead to one of two things. In acute porphyria, like Alicia's acute intermittent porphyria, it means things like stress or some medications can trigger very painful attacks to the nervous system. In cutaneous or skin porphyrias, like the more common porphyria cutanea tarda, it causes painful blistering and severe reactions to sunlight. Medway didn't have a clue what it was. It was a doctor from King's that came down to do the actual initial tests. It was a lot of research and obviously a lot of meetings with the doctors to find out exactly what it is, what, what it could have on my life, an impact on my life. When she was hospitalised during her first attack, Alicia was unconscious for most of the time, but her mum, Kate, was there by her side. During the two weeks that it took for doctors to even think about testing for porphyria, Kate had to watch her daughter suffer. It was very unnervy because it was the unknown. Um, she didn't know what was going on at all. There were times where I would walk in, she sat on the floor in the corridor rocking because she knew absolutely nothing because the medications that they'd given her, the staff or nursing staff didn't know what to do with her because they hadn't diagnosed it at the time. They finally looked back on her history because her grandmother was diagnosed with it and we found out that way that that's how, what she's got. To make it easier for people to understand, I've named him Fred. In our blood there's A, B, C and D, but in my blood there's A, C and D, it completely misses B. So when Fred, he lives in my liver, he realises that B's missing. He'll come out of my liver trying to find B and he causes pain and he causes damage when he comes out of my liver. I hate Fred. I don't like him at all. <laughs> Obviously the blame is me, it's my body, right? But I'm not going to sit there and blame myself, am I? <laughs> so I'd rather blame something else. King's College Hospital in London is one of few porphyria centres in the UK. Simon Guppy is a specialist nurse there, and he explains why many doctors may have never heard of the disease before. So porphyria has very non-specific symptoms. So you can have abdominal pains which are excruciating, very, very bad, but there are lots of things that can cause abdominal pain. And 
when you go to your doctor, they may go their whole life, really, without ever seeing anyone that has porphyria. So it's much more likely, and because it's so rare, it's much more likely that it'll be something else causing that abdominal pain than porphyria. Acute porphyrias, like Alicia's acute intermittent porphyria, are characterised by acute attacks. During an attack, patients experience symptoms like severe abdominal pain, nausea and vomiting, confusion and muscle weakness. But when they're not experiencing an attack, acute porphyria sufferers show very few symptoms. I can normally go about my day-to-day -day things normally. I have the odd pain, which I have to take painkillers from a day-to-day -day basis. My attacks normally last anything from four to ten days, um, and I'm generally in hospital for no less than three weeks. Usually it starts with I'll get tummy pains, again I'll get memory loss, so I won't remember what I've eaten or what I'm supposed to be doing, or if I get pain, sickness, I can't eat. Um, that's a key sign as well. After the initial tax pass, you do get pains for a bit longer. Um, so it's just making sure you can maintain those pains so you can come home and manage them. Because obviously you don't want to come home and the pains are they're exactly the same when you can't manage them. To help her manage the painful attacks, Alicia gets an IV drip of Normasang twice a week. It's similar to heme and helps her cope with the pain. It's also currently the only treatment available in the country for acute porphyria and doesn't completely prevent attacks. Here, Alicia's nurse Carol is administering the treatment. Normasang is um, sensitive to light, so we didn't cover it up. That's like our, our urine sensitive to light. It goes a different colour. Many patients can't look at it going in. Really? It's because it's going in. Yeah. She, knows, so she said, I can't look at it. Especially when I'm putting the drug in the bag, she gets a bit freaky at that bit. It reminds that. me of um, like Harry Potter when yeah, you put it in right? the bag. It doesn't hurt. It's just, I don't know, it's makes like pressure, I guess, but I don't feel anything. <laughs> Do you get a metallic taste sometimes with the flush, with the. Um, Turlock. Yeah, yeah, the Turlock. I get a bit weird taste. Instantly, isn't it? Yeah, very weird. But Alicia is only one of hundreds thought to have porphyria in the UK. There are several other types of the disease, and each one has its own signs, symptoms, and complications. The British Porphyria Association has more information about how many people struggle with it. It is really difficult to quantify. There are no specific numbers that are still all very much unknown. But it is thought that it may be more common for people to have a genetic mutation than their first thought. PCT is the most common kind of porphyria, and it's thought to affect one in every 10,000 people in Europe. AIP is the most common acute porphyria, and is thought to affect one in every 20,000 people. The next most common porphyria is EPP. It only affects one in every 50 to 75,000 people in Europe. Gareth Keeler is 30 and lives in Kent. He has EPP. It's one of the skin porphyrias characterized by light sensitivity. If Gareth is outside in sunlight for too long, his skin will react negatively. The most common skin symptoms for porphyria are blistering, sensitivity to sunlight, and an itching and burning sensation similar to prickly heat. It's these reactions to sunlight that give skin porphyrias the nickname vampire disease. When I have a reaction, first signs are I get the burning sensation through my blood vessels. So that starts, I start getting blisters and obviously that starts causing me irritating, scratching. There's no pain relief. The only thing that will comfort me is a fan and cold water. Nobody in the family suffers with the same condition I've got. I'm the only one. It's thought that as many as one in every 1,700 Europeans could carry the porphyria gene, but only 5% of them will ever have symptoms. This could be why Gareth is the only one in his family who has EPP. Like Alicia, Gareth struggled to get an accurate diagnosis. I was misdiagnosed probably when I was around the age of 10. They diagnosed me with a condition from, uh, from myalgia. I was just in so much pain back then because I didn't know what it was. About four years ago when I saw Dr Fakaran at Medway, I was then told that I had a EPP basically and that was literally something that Great Ormond Street missed from one simple test. Gareth and Alicia aren't the only ones who had issues being diagnosed. Out of 15 people, 
all affected by different types of porphyria, 11 of them said that they were either misdiagnosed or had to wait for an accurate diagnosis. But the test for porphyria is fairly simple, so why have so many had issues? Usually it's a case of that no one has thought to test for porphyria. It's been reported as things like 22 years until people have been diagnosed. What we're actually encouraging is for the medical professional and students to think rare. So if they eventually have excluded all the ordinary things that it could possibly be, they're still struggling to find what it might be, they think rare they are likely to come up with the right condition eventually. Many patients complain that their GPs don't listen to them. Deborah Tomley is 49 and lives in Ramsgate. She suffers from variegate porphyria, or VP, which is both acute attacks and cutaneous symptoms. It's extremely rare, and she also struggled to get a diagnosis. I was diagnosed, I was in my early 30s, I think, um, obviously I had lots of skin blistering, um, I'd gone through loads of sort of minor attacks, I had sort of thousands and thousands of tests, in the end they decided that I was doing it to myself. Your skin's itching so much and you just can't really get, you, you just have to deal with it to be honest because there's nothing that they're giving me that was helping and then for, to be told, oh, well you must be doing it to yourself and you know you're not, it's kind of like heartbreaking really because you you then think oh I've got to live with this because no one's going to help me. My brother he started to get blistering and he lived in a different area so a doctor who instantly recognised it as porphyria. He said to me get yourself tested it's genetic and that was uh, that's how I found out that I had porphyria. My last attack was when I was 39 uh, it was post pregnancy I had obviously my hormones were raging um, and it was the worst attack I've ever had. And I was just so, I just couldn't move. I just, if, if to breathe was hard, you know, I just wanted it to end. It was so, so painful. You can't really see the scars very well, but some of the redness there in my knuckles where I've had them before. Um, there's a scar, a little tiny scar there where it, it, that was obviously a really bad one because there's a lump in my skin. Um, I had quite bad ones on my feet as well. It's just like exposed areas. The lack of awareness about porphyria doesn't just make diagnosis complicated. It's difficult to manage and live with and impacts the rest of patients' lives as well. It's very hard, very hard, especially if I've got to go for something else, like see a urology doctor or a different type of doctor, and you say, well, I've got porphyria, so I can't have this, kind of that, and they're like, well, what's that? Or if I ended up going to a pharmacy, they don't have a clue, not a single clue. To get the medication that, that she needed, they physically had to send paperwork down from King's like an idiot guide on what to do and how to make it up because nobody knew what to do. I do understand there's obviously a lot of illnesses out there and everyone's not going to know everything. Um, so I do try and stick to one pharmacy and one thing. So it makes their life easier. If they get to know me, um, then they can do a bit of research on it. And you definitely know a difference between a doctor that's just asked you in or a doctor that's done a little bit of research or even looked at your notes before you've gone in. It isn't, well, it hasn't been the easiest of times because, I mean, you never want your kid ill, so you just do what you have to do to keep the home, the house and everything else going, so... Diagnosis is an issue because doctors don't really know what porphyria is, so if GPs can't help those suffering, what support is available? Kings are brilliant. Um, Simon Guppy are brilliant, Professor Reese, Jackie are all brilliant. Um, and also BPA, around, they're always around for helps and questionings. There's obviously a network of porphyria specialists and uh, specialist testing labs around the UK. There's a network of local doctors who we're also aware of, or there's people's own GPs that work alongside those porphyria specialists. And then we try and help by providing signposting to all the other resources that people might need. And altogether, it's just about helping people be more aware that things are available. The British Porphyria Association, or BPA, is one group that's been especially useful by providing fundraising, information and community events. Because of all the help that the BPA has given her, Deborah is walking to raise money for them this year. 
Last year I done uh, the Walk a Thousand Miles Challenge, which is run by Ch- uh, Country Walking Magazine. This year, uh, there's I think there's about 25,000 people taking part, so it's a gro- <laughs> growing number of people. Um, so I decided to do it for charity, so I'm doing it for the British Porphyria Association, as uh, you know, myself and two of my children have got the disease. So I'm hoping to walk 1,968 miles, because I'm 50 this year, so that's my birth year. But those who have the disease have also built their own community and give each other support, advice and comfort. A large part of that is a Facebook group run by the BPA for those struggling. I find that a lot of people put questions on there that can generally relate to yourself between obviously friends and family, Kings, Medway, Hospital and BPA and the Facebook group. There's generally a lot of support out there. It's such a good group. Anyone who asks questions, any problems, I read through that on a day-to-day basis. I keep up to loop the notifications. In my circumstance, nobody in my family else has it, so it's nice to be told, you know, it's not just me that's out there. We have basically got to be our own doctors. I'm not going to, unless it's like Professor Reese or Simon Guppy or... I'm not going to trust any other doctor and say, well, this medication's OK. I'll do my own research, I'll do my own checking on my own safe lift and online to make sure, because it is my life, it's not theirs.